I like it's press right. record. It's like ah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah, another episode of the Path to You. Today we're joined by Jeremy, or as I called him, Jay Wade. Um, we played flag football together almost ten years ago now, which is crazy to think about. Um, but when we met, you were a bank examiner for the U.S. Treasury, living in San Francisco, and now. You have a plethora of titles. Um, just going to read through them. Office of Digital, or Director of Office of Digital Learning and Online Education, Founding Director of, I'm going to say, Jindal Center of Social Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and co founder of Armadillo Digital. So, Mr. J. Wade, how did you get here? Yeah, great question. And it's, it's so great to catch up with you after all this time. And I know. Um, yeah, it's been it's been an interesting ten years since we last played flag football together. Um, yeah, in two thousand and twelve, I made the decision, an interesting decision, to make a real bold, adventurous life move, and you know, one of those moves that a lot of people thought I was crazy about, and even I thought I was a bit crazy. <laughs> to do, but it was to, you know, to leave the U.S. and, and to move to Delhi, India. And without knowing anyone, actually, and without a real clear plan of what, you know, I was going to do. But, you know, I had some big ideas in mind in terms of, you know, we should experiment, you know, with, you know, big decisions and take, you know, bold moves, if we feel that the direction is mostly in, in the right way. And what I believed at the time was that the world was moving a bit more towards Asia. So even if I just went for a few years, you know, you know, just understanding Asian culture was going to be a benefit from a career perspective. And I, I grew up in a small town. Uh, we met in San Francisco, but I grew up in a small town in Oklahoma. And, you know, I think in a, in a community with a not very much diversity and moving to San Francisco for my first job, I really encountered, you know, the amazing things about San Francisco yeah. <laughs> in terms of diversity and creative thinking and innovation and yeah. Talk every, about culture everything. Shock. Yeah, and I think, it, but it was, it was, it really was transformational to, to, you know, how I thought about well, how I want to live the rest of my life mm. and what kind of exposure that I want to get. And, um, you know, I think that led to that uh, decision to, you know, let's go experiment in Asia. But who, who would have thought that all these years later, I'd still be here. And I think yeah. that's, that's what became quite interesting. Okay, but you had quite a path to where you are now though. So there's like, I think some research assistance roles and I think maybe you've traveled before landing in, in India. Um, yeah. I think a couple of questions that I have from there is why New Delhi, India and um, what was kind of the spark moment of like, I should probably go leave at this point in time. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of experimentation, I have to be honest. Um, you know, you know, in those first few years, it took about, you know, three years for me to get a clear idea of, you know, what I'm working on and what I want to do uh, fully. So those first three years was a lot of ex learning, you know, listening, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, experimenting and failing a little bit. Um, but, you know, why India? It was you know, a couple of reasons at the time. It was one, I was, I was beginning to get really interested in, in a concept of social entrepreneurship and social innovation in San Francisco, in fact. Mm. And, you know, India has been known as kind of one of the hubs or hotspots for, you know, this kind of innovation in terms of, you know, experimenting with, um, you know, the private sector's role in, in, in addressing social and environmental problems in collaboration with, 
you know, philanthropy and the government and kind of an openness to experimentation. So I, that was one reason as I really wanted to work in that uh, space um, in India. So that was one reason. Um, I, I don't, and part of the reason I just don't even know, I think there was a, there was some, there's some draw that India had that drew me in. I think the, the spirituality, uh, you know, it's a birthplace of so many religions. You know, I think there's something kind of mystic about India as well that probably had a small role to play. Um, but then I, I did have a bit of a logical mind to it as well in terms of kind of the big picture. I was, you know, I was working at the treasury department and in the heart of the financial crisis when I was in San Francisco. And I, I, I definitely started thinking about, well, what does the U.S. look like in a couple of decades from a financial perspective? Mm. And it wasn't a very rosy picture, to be honest. And yeah. then I went down that thought experiment a bit. And, you know, I think this kind of led me to the, the research roles that I ended up doing, because this is where my mind was kind of gravitating towards thinking about these big trends in globalization and and international relations and, um, you know, the, re the relationship of China. So I went to China also and worked, uh, did an internship uh, in an investment bank in China. And I was really deeply interested in, you know, in China at that time too. And what, you know, and, to, and today it's becoming very obvious that that relationship between the U.S. and China is, is, is foundational and key and, and it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's trending in a negative direction. And, um, yeah, and I think India is, has an important role to play. You know, India is a democracy. You know, the U.S. is a democracy. Um, you know, and I think this, uh, the values of democracy and its sustainability, I guess, over decades, India has a, a really important role to play. And, you know, India is a very diverse country. And, um, yeah, I think there's, uh, that was also in my thinking as well. Okay. When you're talking about decades from now, it made me think of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, what's his mm. name? Robert Kiyosaki, I think. Yeah. And I have been listening to some of his videos that he's been putting out on his podcast about he thinks that the US dollar is essentially going to crash in the next year or so, and that we should be investing in gold, silver, and Bitcoin and not the stock market. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's, I, and it's, I, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you know, I, I probably when I, yeah, I was in college, I think, and those, the, the perspectives he had is definitely something I've entertained um, in my thinking a lot, too, in terms of, you know, I bought gold, I, I own gold, I have some Bitcoin, I, yeah. I definitely have gone down those tracks of thinking, and I think it, it's, 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 particularly for Americans, it's, it's probably wise to, to keep an open mind about the way things have always been and what yeah. they might look like as we, as we move forward in terms of, yeah, the dollar's role in the world and, mm -hmm. you know, what that means for, you know, our, our saving for our, our, you know, financial future. I think we, we have to be able to keep an open mind and diversify as much as, as we can, I suppose. So I, I'm on board with a lot of those, a lot of his, a lot of his thinking. Yeah. Okay, good to know. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that might be true for everything in life at this point, like diversify our thinking and well diversify okay. the way that, you know, the way we've been doing things is not working and that's becoming very apparent. Um, I mean, before we jumped on the recording, talking about blue skies now and it was orange skies for at least, you know, a couple of days and the fires are going crazy on the West Coast and people are still trying to say that it's a hoax, which is just crazy. Um, but I think if there's something that can spark diversifying our thoughts, whether that's through conversation or just some sort of um, pull of God <laughs> of some sort, uh, I think that would be helpful for everyone. So. Um, what has it been like in India with whether it was shelter in place or any of the stuff that's happening? Yes. So India went in a full scale lockdown and it was a fairly strict one for, um, I'm trying to remember now, maybe 40 days or oh, definitely over a month. 
and it was a surprise at the time and it seemed to be fairly well uh enforced and i mean i should i should flip it i should say people were f fairly compliant i think with with it and the government was very proactive and very clear so i think you know as i watched the us's response and compared it to what i was seeing here that was one stark difference is the, the clarity uh public response yeah. you know however it it um if you look at the numbers today india continues the cases continue to grow and we uh, you know are having to open up uh you know you know the economy just because it's a, it's a difficult trade off and i think um the economy versus you know the health is is not not a trade-off anyone wants to have to make as a policymaker, I think, but yeah. you know, it, it gets particularly difficult when you have a country with so many people, you know, at, at low income levels um, and informal work. Uh, it's even harder, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, you know, it's been a challenge. I think it's a challenge everywhere. And India's certainly not immune. Yeah. So you said you were sitting at a WeWork, so things have opened, but numbers are still rising. How, like, how do you feel being in the public communal space? Um, yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I definitely um, feel, I feel like with a mask and social distance, I feel safe. I don't know if I should or not, but I feel that <laughs> way. And, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I suppose, you know, there's always risk and we have to weigh the, you know, the, the those risks, but yeah, yeah I think uh, luckily I don't live with any uh, at risk, you know, people in my house. I think those that do, I think, have an even harder challenge to you know to think about in terms of yeah. decisions like that. But yeah, it's it's a it's a tricky one. Yeah. Um, going back to uh, your work, so you you have these three major titles now, and. You had mentioned going to India, you didn't know anyone. And now, I guess it's almost 18 years, no, eight years later, not 18. I'm so messed up on my timelines. Um, how did you manage to, I mean, you're a tall white guy in the middle of India. <laughs> um, how did you create yeah. those relationships and, and get people to get on track with what you were thinking? Yeah, you know, I certainly came in a perspective that I wanted to learn and listen before I had uh, any clear, you know, directions, uh, you know, or that I wanted to try to lead in anyone in any direction. So that, that was, that was really important. Um, you know, I think certainly there's a legacy, you know, with um, white people in India and white people in any developing country. And I think being mindful of that was a, a, a big part of my own learning um, yeah. and how to, how to think about that. And my approach was, like I said, to try to, to listen and learn as much as I could and, and be as collaborative as I could and even to this day. You know, but my, you know, whole approach was to build kind of a long-term um, relationship with with the university. So this university that I'm that I'm at, I've been at essentially the whole time I've been in India. And I've built relationships at the university and built trust with people at the university. And the university itself is very globally minded, very um, you know open to global ideas, and also very ambitious about you know sharing India's local ideas to the world and i think that's been a fascinating um you know experience for me to participate in, in, in that process so there you know i'm not the only <laughs> white guy you know you know wandering about the, the university <laughs> there's there's a, a decent you know group of international faculty not just from you know the us or from from europe but uh from you know africa and from you know uh, East Asia and uh, all over. So it's, you know, that's been, that's been really interesting. But, 
Yeah, I had mentioned earlier my interest, you know, at the beginning of my time in India was around social innovation, social entrepreneurship, which I'm still incredibly passionate about and interested in furthering, I know, as models to, to reimagine what the economy can do and what incentives for people to, you know, do more with their life than just make money, you know, or just be productive. You know, what, what also can we, you know, do in a meaningful way, in a measurable way to, to improve our communities, to improve the environment while still, you know, making your livelihood, you know, building a business, you know, in that same framework. How do you, how do we synthesize this? How do we create some kind of holistic approach is mm -hmm. something that I thought deeply about and I, I've tried to, you know, and then that's what the center that I started in 2015 was dedicated towards is, you know, advancing these ideas, um, helping entrepreneurs build businesses with this kind of perspective, uh, you know, developing tools and research to help, you know, just educate more people on the, the, the great case studies that are out there uh, to do this. Um, and I worked on that for a number of years. I still do. But this new uh, role that I've taken on is, is a big part as a response to COVID. And it's, you know, the university has thought about online education in a completely different way. So, you know, I've taken up the, you know, responsibility and the opportunity to help the university um, build out kind of their vision for online education. And yeah, we're thinking really bold and interestingly and um, developing some online degrees and uh, online certificates for, you know, people of all ages, not just university students, but people, everyone needs to keep learning and uh, adapting in this economy. So I think yeah. that's the perspective. So how can we lower the cost and, and uh, higher the quality of education and, and, and get it to people where they need it and when they need it. And I think yeah. there's, a, there's a ton of potential and uh, exciting opportunities to do that with online education. Yeah. Yeah, it's, there are so many different directions that I want to go with this question. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to bring up was I read an article that you wrote about um, Netflix for education and thought that that was a really interesting concept. Could you elaborate more on like your idea behind that and how that would look in the space that you're talking about? Yeah, so, you know, I've been working with some of the really great online learning platforms um, over the last few years. Um, Coursera, uh, FutureLearn in particular, these two. And part of this is, you know, from what I've you know, learned from, from them and those, you know, great thought leaders in these organizations, but that the future, you know, is certainly um, with technology and with just changing habits or, you know, around using the internet, there's, you know, there's just so much opportunity to deliver education in a different way. And there's, you know, the legacy of education of in the classroom, you know, has, has been that way so long. And, you know, I think it's, it's as a result, it hasn't innovated, uh, you know, as much. So, I mean, the idea of Netflix or education is just that the very best professors who can, you know, or not even a professor, but just an industry expert or just a great storyteller who can really, you know, create a, a learning, you know, outcome uh, for someone in a way that just works for a lot more people. Um, and then getting that to, to the people that need it kind of in a way that a Netflix would do it. And I think um, there's still a long ways to go in that vision, but I think that, you know, more and more we're, we're slowly moving in that direction. Yeah. How would you account for like people who don't have either smart devices or computers or Wi-Fi? What would be the way around that? Yeah, that, I mean, that's incredibly uh, difficult challenge everywhere, and in particular in, in, in India. I, and I don't think that we should replace education with online education. That's one thing I I'm, I'm, I'm feel strongly about. I think 
online education and these new models can, you know, transform and create high quality, low cost solutions, but we can't just discard the legacy institutions. And, um, you know, we, you, with education, I think government has an important role to play and that's true everywhere. Philanthropy has an important role to play. And a Netflix of education is more of a private, you know, tech uh, idea and not a, a government or, um, you know, a philanthropy probably approach, but we need both to, I think, deliver, you know, good education to everyone. Yeah. It's interesting to hear someone who's working in the digital space still talking about in-person things. Um, <laughs> what, why do you think that the in-person is still necessary given the progression that we're having with the digital space? Yeah. I mean, I think human nature, partly, I think we're all feeling that, you know, something is a bit missing with an entire digital life. And, yeah. you know, I think if you can't meet in person, then of course, digital is great. But if, you know, you had the opportunity maybe to blend the best of physical and the best of digital, I think we'd all want that. Yeah. And I think that's where we want to move is, you know, having, having both for those that, you know, can, when we're talking about education, it's tricky. Not everyone has the luxury to, you know, to go take off for years and not, you know, be employed. You know, I think that model is, is, you know, great for a, a portion of the population, but it's not realistic for everyone. And, um, yeah, I think and we're talking about higher education uh, specifically, but yeah, I think ideally we have the best of both physical and uh, digital. Yeah. I think about like classes that I took when I was in college and granted that was 2005, 2006, um, my senior year where we started having online classes only and you didn't have to meet in person um, but we were talking about like really interesting topics that would have been nice to have at least like a Zoom call where there was a round robin discussion because um, it was around like one class in particular that I'm thinking of was um, race in movies and there were topics around like interracial dating and um, what does that look like in the movies versus what does that look like in real life and so um, it's just fascinating that we're now started like 10 15 years later we're going to have the, those dynamics actually take place um whether it was forced or not yeah yeah you know and i think back to what i was saying at the beginning about you know growing up in a small town without so much exposure to diversity and i think that is one you know thing that you know this kind of education if designed well can do is, you know, to really deliver, um, you know, perspectives from different backgrounds and different locations around the world, you know, in a classroom. So that, that, that design can be done. And I think in the, the world we're living in, where um, we're, we're just struggling to find empathy, I think, for everyone, um, this is, seems to be the, the key if, you know, we're going to move forward with the internet all over the world, we're going to have to elevate our empathy, you know, yeah. in a, in a way that we're not coming to, you know, yeah. we're not living up to it at the moment. Yeah. Well, I think that it, empathy requires us to allow ourselves to feel and we're particularly in the United States, like we're not taught how to feel or like how to mm. process emotions. And I think that's why we're seeing a lack of empathy because if we feel or if we're feeling negative emotions, ooh, stop, bad, I don't want to feel that. So instead of empathizing with you, I'm just going to project hate because I'm not allowing myself to feel the pain, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, mean, I think, yeah, I'm certainly, you know, not an expert on mental health, but I know enough to know that 
we have a lot of work to do in the U.S. <laughs> uh, every, everywhere, but I think in the yeah. U.S. in particular, I think in terms of talking about these issues and um, and teaching, you know, our, our kids and ourselves how to to just help self care. It's one thing to yeah. you know take care of ourselves emotionally, and then and yeah, uh, definitely understand emotions of those around us better than we do. Right. Yeah. I wonder if, I mean, you said you grew up in a small town in Oklahoma and you have the lug, you had the luxury of, you know, moving to India and spending time in Europe. And so it gives you this perspective of other cultures and how they've grown and lived. And um, do you think that because the United States is so big versus other countries that can travel to other countries near them, does that place a, not a hardship, but that maybe barrier or wall where we don't understand or try to understand people because we've never had that experience. Mm. Yeah, I have thought about this uh, quite a bit. I think one thing about the U.S. is since the, you know, 50s, 60s, the U.S. has you know, just been so economically successful and um, kind of a, you know, global powerhouse, um, you know, which kind of probably hit its height in the 90s. Um, I think there wasn't so much incentive for Americans to learn about other cultures. Um, a few, you know, a small portion of the population traveled and, and, and got exposure, but for most people, there wasn't the incentives but if you lived in a country that didn't have that luxury, I think American culture found its way into your house without you doing anything. And that ended up just making it different, I think. And I think as a result, sometimes I, I think back and I think Americans are, yeah, a bit sheltered um, in, in a lot of ways. Although I think the internet's changing that for everyone, but yeah. I think, uh, yeah, certainly, you know, there's, I noticed that in myself growing up uh, comparing it to, you know, what I've learned since, you know, I moved abroad, but yeah. You know. Yeah. I remember the first time I left, like having grown up in the barrier and the first time leaving and I was like, wait, it's not diverse everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Why are people staring at me? Why are you confused by me? <laughs> yeah, it, that was um, like reverse culture shock on some level. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Um, so a lot of times the people, people I bring onto the show have played sports and they're former athletes. And I mean, we've met playing flag football, but um, I mean, I know you played basketball too. Has being an athlete shaped your experiences growing up as well as, you know, working in the business world and in education. Yeah, absolutely. I think the first 20, uh, 18 to 20 years of my life, I think my entire identity was sports and being an athlete. Yeah. You know, I started from a very young age, you know, playing every sport that the, you know, it was offered and I continued to do that into, uh, you know, into middle school and then in high school, I played multiple sports, uh, you know, and um, it, yeah, it was just a defining feature of who I thought I was. And when I, I chose the college that I went to, I, I chose that college because I wanted to, to walk on and, and, and play uh, football uh, at Pittsburgh State University. Um, and I remember, so my, uh, the summer between my senior year in college, I went and played in some, there were like uh, all-star games of different, from different schools coming together and playing. And I got injured in one of those games. And, you know, as a result, I wasn't able to walk on, uh, you know, mm. at my, in that fall. And, then around uh, halfway through that year, I kind of just, it just dawned on me that, you know, 
for, for multiple reasons. One, the injury, two, just the realization, you know, that I, I needed to pay for school and, and, and I needed to work and not play football. Um, it just dawned on me that my, you know, that that path was over. And I remember at the time I, it was in the shower, I think in the dorm room and I just like burst out into tears. And uh, mm. I think I just had felt that I had failed, you know? So mm -hmm. I didn't have at that time, another way to think about, you know, well, what the future looks like, what is my identity going forward? Yeah. So uh, I think that was a real foundational, um, you know, memory that I have, but, but luckily I was able to, I think, you know, imagine the future without being an athlete, but still using everything that I learned. And I think uh, for that, I'm incredibly fortunate because I think, you know, that approach to, you know, training and, you know, the next game, the next season, you know, preparing. And I think all of those lessons in, in teamwork and collaboration and leadership, I mean, all these are, just absolutely integral to how I, I think I, I operate today. Um, so for that, I'm, yeah, I'm super, super thankful um, yeah. for, for that. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that that is something that, that can set athletes apart from other people who are non-athletes in whether it's business or any, any entity of life? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you can get these, you know, these skills and all kinds of activities, but I, I do think sports and particularly team sports, but I actually, I mean, it's a, a team sports does something interesting. And I think individual sports does something interesting. Mm -hmm. um, the team sports, I think, uh, really gives you that sense of, of how, you know, working together collaboratively. And I think in business and, and any projects, I mean, I think it's, 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 it's critical. Um, but I think in individual sports too, it that that kind of um, sense that you know to that you know you need to you know train and almost you know compete with yourself and um, improve. And I think even those you know lessons are I think are I think they do give it. I think they do give people an advantage who have have um, had done this in a rigorous way over. You know, those who don't probably just also just the physical um, benefits too, just, uh, you know, the, the mind and the body and, uh, you know, being attuned to, mm -hmm. to that, I think is a, is a great thing that I'm, I'm really thankful for years later that um, I can, I can sense my body probably better if I'd never been an athlete, you know, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. so that's another yeah. I, I took a yoga teacher training, God, like three years ago now. And I remember we were learning about our body in different poses. And I was just, again, like you said, so grateful that I have this immense amount of experience of being in tune with my body. Because if I didn't know, okay, that's where my hip is. And I just need to move it slightly this way. If I didn't have that relationship with my body from sports and going through so many different trainings and knowing you needed to adjust here to move for this play. I don't think that I would have been as grateful for the practice of yoga as I was if I didn't, um, which I'm sure that's not the case for everyone, but yeah, it's, uh, it's so interesting to talk to different athletes and their perspectives on how it's affected them, whether mentally, physically, or both and what they're doing now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yoga, yoga is one that I've, I didn't have any experience with when I was younger, but I've, you know, over the last, and India is a big place for yoga actually. Um, but it's I've gotten really place. into yoga myself. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, but I've gotten really into it. I, 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 you know, try to keep a regular practice and yeah, I think it's, it's a fantastic, um, way to, to, yeah, maintain that body mind connection and, um, yeah. and for flexibility too. I feel like, you know, I, you know, flexibility, I, I realize as I get older, it's, it's, it's so important. I, um, I continue to run, but without stretching, I ended up, you know, getting myself, you know, injured or 
so just yeah the yoga and the, and the flexibility yeah it's a, it's a great practice yeah and i i like to think that, that there's also an emotional mm. release to it as well like especially with all the hip and heart opening poses like mm. it's just i always get a good crying when i have a good hip opening class <laughs> but yeah yeah absolutely i yeah I, I think i think you know, you can often like store stress uh, in the body, right? I think, mm -hmm. and uh, for me, it's definitely the hips. So I've noticed, so yeah, I, I have a similar experience. Yeah. When I do a good <laughs> hip opening, it's like, so like it really unlocks <laughs> something. Exactly. Yeah. There's in our teacher training, we learned that the hips are like the central of like your flight or fight system. And so when mm. things go in process, they kind of just get stored there because you don't run or you don't hide. So when you finally do open up and unlock that space and it releases whatever was stagnant there and then it purges out through the tears that's awesome so, yeah um oh, what was i gonna ask you i'm gonna go to my notes and cheat um What advice do you have for people who are looking to transition in their careers? I mean, you went from working in the financial sector to working in the digital space, um, working for a very government organization to a very social, innovative space. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that everyone that can should try to move like that if they can. I think we're, I mean, humans are not one thing, you know, where mm -hmm. our brains aren't just, we're not just accountants and, we're, and we also shouldn't be defined so much by our profession, which often happens too much. Yeah. And I think the more you can do different things, the less you feel like you're defined by any one thing. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that said, it's, it's, it's not easy. And it's usually financially not smart, <laughs> you know, in the, um, in the short term. But mm -hmm. I think in the long term, I think it's, it's a brilliant thing to do if you can get through the short to medium term. Um, but, you know, my advice would just be for people to um, experiment when they can, uh, be open, and, but you have to do the hard work. I think if you're going to shift like that and one piece of advice I might have is, is maybe don't shift too far. It, there's some wisdom to just shifting a little bit. Um, Cause then you at least know a little bit about what you're shifting into. Yeah. I haven't followed that advice, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little easier than, than having to go full, full on shift, but there's advantages to that too. If you can, if you can handle that, uh, yeah. but it's, it's not easy. Yeah. What is that work that you're talking about to, to make that shift? Like you said, it's going to take work. Yeah. 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 I think the biggest thing is to unlearn. Um, mm. You know, of course there's a lot of learning as well, but unlearning becomes as important as learning yeah. when you make a huge shift like that, because what made you successful may not, it may actually hinder you. Um, so listening, um, really well um and yeah i think is is a big is a big thing yeah listening to yourself to other people who are, who are you listening to mm, both but uh, i was specifically mentioned thinking um you know other people that because you know the if you're if we're talking about a career change let's say you know, moving from the government to education, uh, just, you know, the, the way things worked maybe in the government and the norms and the practices versus in the university, let's say, just will be so different yeah. that, you know, just learning and then listening to, you know, others and how they operate. Um, but listening to yourself is a great point. I think, um, I think that's always sage advice. Yeah. I had a, a coach that once said, when you 
the difference between a choice and the decision is when you have a choice, you operate from your instinct and from your gut. When you have a decision, you tend to work from the past. You think about things, you might overthink things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think there's a case for each depending on the scenario, but usually your gut Certainly. instinct knows what's up. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, can you talk about the t companies that you started? So Armadillo Digital mm -hmm. and the, the center. Um, how did those come about in, in finding those or founding those? Yeah, they're, they're, they're both uh, different, but there's certainly some similarities. You know, the, um, the center was founded, it was essentially a new university um, kind of institute. And the university itself was a startup. It, it only, you know, it's only four or five years old. So is, there wasn't a legacy. You typically think of a university, you think, oh, it's been around for 100 years or 50 years, but right. this was a new university. So, so it was new, but it had some minimal backing um, in terms of the institution. You know, the company, which I s started a few years ago, um, uh, co-founded it with my, my fiance now, that was, you know, something completely different. And it, you know, was, it, it was started as a, as a kind of a digital agency, um, like marketing. Um, okay. And it was part of, part of the, the work that she was doing as a consultant, um, kind of turning that into a business. But also we both had, you know, some, hypothesis and some ideas about opportunities in India, digital opportunities in India over, you know, over the long term. So two Americans starting a company in India um, wasn't easy and it took a long time and it's still, you know, struggling along and, 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 you know, it's, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's something that was very informative in terms of, you know, what, what does it really mean to start something in the marketplace for me? You know, I, you know, working in government, working in the universities, and then this, this is something different. And I think that was a great lesson for me to, to really understand what does it really mean to have to, you know, survive off, you know, just the revenue of that business. Um, mm -hmm. And it has to, to earn revenue for, you know, you to be paid. And I think, you know, this is, um, was a great, you know, lesson. Now what I, what I try to do is, is um, have the company and the other work that I do kind of complement each other. And, and I think that has worked, um, you know, yeah. for us. I was just going to say one sounds like it could be a feeder for the other. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah. Two Americans starting a company in India. How, so do you have dual citizenship now or like what, how does that part work? Mm, no, I don't. So I have a long-term, I've had a, I've had a long-term kind of work visa that I have here and I have to renew that each year. Okay. Um, my per, uh, my partner, my fiance, she's, you know, of Indian origin. So there's a special status that um, Americans of Indian origin can, can get which allows them to stay on a long-term basis. And I think that's, that's been, it's a great program for Indian Americans. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's always a bit of an uncertainty, of course, when you, you know, you don't, you're not a citizen of a country and you operate a business and your you know, whole working life. So that's, I mean, I think that's, that's there. Um, yeah. So have you thought, I'm assuming you thought about like, if your visa didn't renew, like what happens with that? Does the company still live? Does it just operate with people who work there or like who are there? Yeah, I mean, it would survive. It would, I mean, I think we would make it survive and continue and um, yeah, I think, you know, we're all, I'm, yeah, 
Well, I'm not too worried about that at this point. Also now that, you know, with the company and with um, my work at the university, I think there's multiple paths to ensure that I can stay around. So hopefully yeah. India doesn't kick me out. <laughs> yeah. They haven't kicked you out yet. I doubt they. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one, there's another thing that I wanted to ask you was the big thing that we were seeing in the news here about India with the lockdown was the air quality. Um, now that <laughs> things are opening back up, how has that been for you? Has it changed? Yeah, that's it. Go back to normal. Yeah, that's that's a great question, and then it's one of the the trade offs and the difficulties of, that I've had and I face living here um, is when I first moved here, you know, the air quality was not great, but it wasn't a huge concern. But over the years that I've been here, it got considerably worse as India, you know, was growing and industrializing fast, um, particularly around the Delhi, you know, this big city that I'm, that I'm living in. To the point where it, over the last couple of years, it got to a place where it was very questionable whether this is a, you know, place I could, it was, you know, wise to live here long term for health reasons. Um, mm. But yeah, that is one big change that uh, I've, you know, with the lockdown, the ac economic activity has, has reduced so much that the skies are completely blue and that's something you don't see in Delhi very much. Mm -hmm. And the air quality has completely shifted. Um, but I'm sure it will return. And um, yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a real concern. I think um, have to, you know, move to, more sustainable ways of living everywhere and um otherwise we're yeah it's not uh not a not a great future don't think we yeah. have another 50 years if that <laughs> yeah D do you think that i mean when i think of social innovation and like digital space sustainability does come to mind for me but i don't think it comes to mind for most people is that something that you encourage your students or um, customers, clients, whatever you want to call them to focus on or to look at when they're in these social innovation labs, whether it's not just yeah. you know, the air, but anything with sustainability? Yeah, and, it, and I think really a deep dive into these, these challenges is we find that there's interconnections um, of course, you know, sustainability with, you know, inequality and economic inclusiveness and they, they end up all being interlinked. And, but, you know, as a social entrepreneur trying to address a problem, usually, you know, that approach is to, to focus on, you know, the problem that they're trying to solve, you know, so if they're focused on, you know, trying to create a, a more sustainable way of, um, you know, designing a certain product or um, the, it, it, there is some wisdom to focusing on that, but the reality is they're all, all these are interconnected. And I think that's why I, the way I think about this going forward is that we ideally want to be able to, you know, analyze impact um, at, like we do risk, you know, we, as an investor in a business, they, there's some great methodologies and tools for, you know, measuring the risk of a, a venture. Um, but how do we measure the impact is something that I think we're all realizing that we need to be doing. And yeah. we don't have a framework to do that, but I think we have to build that. I think that's the, 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 the re, you know, just the, it has to be the agenda going forward as we, we, we just can't continue without understanding the impact that business has on society um, and try to optimize or try to, to, to lead things that create positive impact or, and reduce those things that create clear, you know, negative impact. But right. until we can measure that and, and assess that and understand the trade-offs between them Right. It gets pretty difficult to build a system that, uh, you know, where, where anyone can make individual decisions, you know, to start mm -hmm. a new business or to, to, to join a company without the, the larger system being able to measure and to optimize 
uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that should be our, our focus. That should be our focus. That's my view now. Yeah. It's almost like ROI becomes return of impact versus like return of investment. Yeah. And, the, and there's people that are working on this and I have an online course on impact investing that's on the platform called FutureLearn, which goes deep into some of these models that investors are using um, to try to what they call like a risk return impact paradigm. So it, mm -hmm. it, it's another layer and there's, there's people that are experimenting. It's still early, to, early days, but yeah, um, yeah I, I highly encourage anyone who's in the space to, yeah, to, dig into this and uh, to try to move this, move this forward. Yeah. So I have two more questions for you. One is why do you think it's taken us so long to come up with that framework? Why are we just now looking at it that way? Um, and two, the second half of that question is what can we do moving forward to continue to get people to think like that? Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, I think even our understanding of accounting came pretty late in like the 30s and 40s, like the rigorous accounting uh, in, in, in kind of the way we evaluate investments is, is, is a fairly modern phenomenon. Um, so in that way, it's not so surprising that we haven't figured it out. But I think another big factor is just our, our collective awareness that's come from the internet and social media mm -hmm. where we're all just becoming so much more exposed to our inter interconnections and mm -hmm. our the role the, the second and the third order consequences of actions and and uh, we're seeing and i think that i think a lot of it is as as well maybe has always been there but we're way more aware plus you know, there, there's also probably more to see, um, both. Yeah. You know, I think, I think awareness is, is a journey that we're all on. Um, I think every day more people get aware of these things. And I think the way forward is if do what each of us do what we can to try to build the system we want, you know, for mm -hmm. the future. Um, and not just buy into the idea that it can't change or that the status quo is how it has to be. I think we're at a moment where it's, it's very clear that the systems aren't working. I think no, no one is, you know, fooled by, by that. But I think there's a, not as many people that can see a way forward. And I think right. those that do, uh, I, think it's, I think it's a responsibility that they take some positive action and, and do what they can. Cause that's the only way that we all, we all start moving that way. Yeah. And recognizing that we can't force people to be aware that everyone's on their own journey. They'll become yeah. aware when they need to. Right. Yeah. Cause then that's something that you can't control. You can't control what somebody else sees. You can only control your, your controllables, what you see. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, final question, any piece of advice that you have for people, whether it's transitions or moving across the world or whatever it is that you want to leave a, a lasting impact on in your final words? Yeah, I think, um, I think I, you know, I mentioned a lot of things already to see if I can mention anything new. I think just being open to you know experimentation in life i think as much as you can um just just being open and and then and then listening and then learning and unlearning and moving forward but yeah i think a lot of times you know it can seem like a big move has for consequences for the rest of your life. But, you know, it turns out, you, you know, if you make a big move, the next move actually doesn't seem so big. And you might be able to just move again and then move again. And then before you know it, you're just, you're living life. And mm -hmm. um, 
you know, I think that's preferable to maybe not making any moves and just kind of sticking where you are, I think. Yeah. And I would say that that applies to not just physically moving, but like mentally moving. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe more important. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You definitely don't have to move across the world. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You don't don't have to, you don't have to go to India. That's for sure. Yeah. (laughs) Possible, but don't have to. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. That's awesome. All right. So I'm going to stop recording here. Um, I'm going to include links below for anything that you'd want to share with people, whether it's how to reach you or what you're working on. Um, Yeah. Thanks for joining on the path to you. I'm going to stop recording and then we can keep talking if you have time. This is great. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Yeah.